the title is a little bit of a play on words in a sense. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that we've been doing at the Australian Synchrotron around the areas of digestion of food and, and milk and infant formula in particular. Um, and to those that were at the top, or who were listening from Lund uh, Physchem two days ago when I gave a presentation, there's some at the start that's similar, but the rest is different. So don't fear too much if it looks familiar. Um, so I wanted to thank uh, Tommy and Selma in particular for not, not only for the invitation, but also congratulations on, on bringing this initiative together. I think it's uh, excellent timing and it's great timing also because the, um, I'm moving to Copenhagen in July. So only about six weeks now until I move over. Um, so I'll literally be bringing Aurora Australis to Northern Lights and um, hopefully I'll look forward to, to meeting many of you and, and working with you um, on some of the, the problems around food and other things that, that we can tackle. Um, so I'm currently based at Monash University, which is in, uh, in Melbourne, at down the bottom of Australia there, and it's almost literally on the other side of the world from Copenhagen. Um, it's amazing what this Zoom thing's done for, for getting people together. Um, and uh, so I'll be 20% still Monash and 80% and Copenhagen from July. So uh, if you're coming to Copenhagen, please um, look me up or give me a call and I'll come over the bridge and, and say hello for sure. So, um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about what we've been doing in the area of lipid digestion and, and structures that form during the digestion of lipids and, and with a bit of a focus on milk and infant formula. As I, as I alluded to. And so I'm sure that many of you are at least somewhat familiar with this idea that you know, the lipids that we ingest in, in the form of food or as pharmaceutical um, ingredients, some instances um, contain mostly triglycerides or at least glyceride based um, lipid molecules. And our body's really well designed for breaking down those triglycerides into monoglycerides and fatty acids to facilitate digestion. So our our body doesn't absorb triglycerides and diglycerides intact. So our digestive process is geared around breaking those down. And triglycerides are, are by far the most prevalent uh, lipid in the, in the lipids that we consume in our diet. And so in the physical chemistry area, we know that when we bring monoglycerides and fatty acids together in, in, in an aqueous environment, that they're likely to self-assemble and form some interesting, interesting structures. And so some of you will be familiar with micelles and, and liposomes and perhaps you've come across some of the other um, self-assembled structures shown here um, you know, through, uh, through your sort of interactions with people in the, in the lipid self-assembly area. I'm, I'm conscious that not everybody's a lipid person unlike two days ago, Tommy, where everyone else knew about this. Um, but the, um, I guess the big question mark that's in the middle there is because although you know, we're probably the, the last group to come into this area and, and people have been interested in this problem for quite some time of understanding the structures that are formed during that digestion process. Um, so what's formed when, under what conditions, and then how does that then impact on absorption, not only of the lipids themselves, but also other components that might be there. So polysoluble vitamins or drugs in a pharmaceutical context. So we've been interested in this problem for a while of, of what happens when, they, when triglycerides are broken down by the body. We know that they'll self-assemble and form different sorts of structures, but the question is what, what really happens in a physiological environment? How can we get close to, to really understanding that using some of the techniques um, you know, at our disposal? And in particular, small angle scattering is a good one for tackling this type of problem because of the length scales that are involved. And so... Uh, so we um, so we're going to talk a bit about milk, and so when uh, you know, when you when you come across milk, usually in a in a conference context or you know in the scientific literature, the focus is almost always on either the the trilayer at the surface of a fat droplet and the proteins that are, that are, that are associated with that, or perhaps the you know, casein micelles or other components that are not part of the core sort of triglyceride droplet. Um, but what we know is that the triglycerides comprise more than 98% of the lipid that's in milk. And only 2% or less, much less than 2% in a lot of cases is due to the other, the phospholipids um, that, are, that are present in that trilayer. So it makes sense that if we're sort of interested in lipids and what lipids are doing during the 
the process of digestion that we, we need to worry about the triglycerides, but they're largely not addressed um, you know, in, in, the, in the literature really at all, perhaps probably more in the physical chemistry literature than anything. And um, they're, you know, so they're sort of the poor cousin, if you like, of the fossil lipids and, and other components, but I think really important in driving some of the structural transformations as we'll see. So, um, so some people are going about um, looking at these types of systems using in vitro lipolysis models. So you can simulate the sort of gastrointestinal environment um, so chemically and enzymatically in a um, so temperature controlled, pH controlled environment and track the, the process of that breaking down of the triglycerides and monoglycerides and fatty acids. And so it was only fairly recently that, um, that we've sort of taken this model and, and the key thing was to sort of couple that up to uh, a synchrotron scattering facility. So the facility in Australia is a is really nice um, small angle X-ray beam line um, down here. It's in Melbourne, right next to our main campus of Monash. So very handy for, for us. Um, and that's really been a critical factor in, in our sort of access to the, to the facility to develop this, this um, capability. And so in simple terms, we take a synchrotron X-ray source. So high flux, high intensity, um, you know, really nice, um, nice setup. And we couple that to a flow through system. So we have our lipid system in here digesting. So in the context of this talk, let's say milk in here digesting, we flow that through a capillary. And if there's ordered structures forming in the system, then we'll, um, we'll get diffraction from, the, from those structures that are formed. So I'm assuming to a degree that most people are, are familiar with, um, with small angle X-ray scattering or you you probably, you know, you may not be on this call if you've not, never heard of it, but I'm not entirely sure of, of the background of everybody on the call. So the, the important thing is if there's, if there's order in the system, then we'll see uh, diffraction and we can correlate that, um, that diffraction to the structures that are, that are formed. I won't, I won't go into that for today's talk, but what we'll see is some interesting behavior in a second of what happens. So the, the important thing then is that, that that then allows us to get time resolved and real-time structural information without disturbing the system. So we don't have to take samples and then analyze them off, yeah, um, offline uh, to, to extract that structural information about the system during digestion. We can do it in real time. And by using the synchrotron source, we can acquire that information, that structural information on the seconds to minute uh, time scale, which is the, the relevant time scale for digestion. So, we, um, so if we take milk and we, and we um, you know, impinge x-rays on milk as it's digesting, so our milk's flowing through our um, sort of flow through loop, if you like. So it starts off life as an emulsion, so relatively unstructured system. Um, but we can see that during digestion, so we're now forming those monoglycerides and, and fatty acids during the digestion process that we see um, different structures forming and then disappearing and, and are replaced by other structures. And so this will be on, on repeat in a second. So I'll talk, talk the way through it. So we start off with our, with our emulsion. Um, we start to form a lamella phase here that's due to calcium soaps formation. So there's calcium in the, in the digestion uh, buffer as there would be in the intestine. And we see a small a, 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 um, micellar cubic phase that, forms and then disappears. We have a hexagonal phase forms and disappears. We have a bicontinuous cubic phase here that's actually left at the end of digestion. So we know from our titration profile that we, we reach essentially 100% digestion of the milk in this format. And so, so this is the structure of those digested fat droplets at the end of the digestion process. So, um, so that's how cow milk behaves. This is just bovine milk straight off the out of the out of the fridge, and um, so a number of questions sort of arise from that. So um, this is this is sorry, I should just elaborate. So this is the video where we've turned it in now into a contour profile. So it might be a bit easier to see some of those changes during digestion. So this is that um, lamella phase or lamella soaps that form. Um, our, you can see our hexagonal phase in here. There's some indicative peaks of micellar cubic phase, and we end up with the bicontinuous cubic phase at the end. 
So we've had that transition or transformation essentially from an unstructured liquid fat droplet at physiological temperature to this highly ordered by continuous cubic phase structure during digestion. And we can, we can see that structures that are formed, uh, or the, the self-assembled structures inside the, the remnants of those fat droplets um, if we do some cryo-TM on those digested systems. And that all makes sense for us from a um, physical chemistry perspective. So we're going to generate more polar lipids. So we expect to see a certain um, order of appearance of different self-assembled structures as we go from the less polar to more polar lipids. And so this critical packing parameter is the, the um, I guess the sort of conceptual framework for understanding that in a physical chemistry sense, and that actually does make sense. Uh, so nature um, does actually follow some of our kind of artificially, not artificially assembled laws, but you know, geometry rules in these, in these uh, systems. So um, back to food. So what do we have to do to milk then to upset its behavior from a structural perspective? So this was the commercial homogenized milk straight off the shelf. And if we have spray dried milk powder, then you can see that there's almost no difference in the, in the, um, the structures that are formed during the digestion process and the kinetics is, is pretty much similar. Um, if we take raw milk, so Holstein cow, so I think they're Danish, are they, um, originally? So um, we can see that the, 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 we do form the bicontinuous cubic phase and the hexagonal phase, but the digestion rate is much slower. So this milk hasn't been homogenized. So we're seeing a, a direct effect there of the um, reduced sort of interfacial area that's available with the larger fat droplets. So it takes longer to get to the point of uh, forming these, these particular structures. And if we let it run for long enough, then we, we'll get to the bicontinuous cubic phase. Um, likewise, if we freeze milk or freeze dry milk and reconstitute it, then again, we get back to the bicontinuous cubic phase at the end of um, digestion. So there's not a lot of difference there. It's actually quite hard to, to upset the behavior of uh, milk during digestion from a self-assembly perspective. Um, so is it just a bovine milk thing? So is it just cow milk that does this? The answer is no. So goat milk also forms by continuous cubic phase, forms a hexagonal phase transiently during digestion. Um, it actually seems to form two different uh, by continuous cubic phases here in succession. Um, and interestingly, at the end of digestion, the, the by continuous cubic phase in this case has disappeared. And so, um, so we know that goat's milk contains a much higher proportion of medium chain uh, fatty acid lipids. So perhaps that's part of the reason for that, that we're, we're ending up in a slightly different um, yeah, overall compositional space than you would see um, with cow milk, but it does go through these uh, self-assembled structures on, on the way there. So, um, so given that, is it so cows and goat milk form these self-assembled structures? So is it, a, is it a mammal thing? And if it is, then we'd expect that human milk might behave the same way. And so if we then look at human milk, and so we're at a slightly higher pH in this instance uh, than the other, the others are typically run at six point, pH 6.5. Um, and so we can see again, that we form a bicontinuous cubic phase, hexagonal phase is a bit more prominent for human milk. So we've got a different lipid composition to what we have in the, in the cow milk. Um, we can see that um, if we just stir milk without ad adding our lipase, that we generate the lamellophase, and that's because of the bile salt stimulated lipase that's present in human milk that's not present in cow milk. So in cow milk, we just see a flat, flat line essentially, or no, no feature from the lamellophase until we add in the lipase. Whereas in human milk, we don't need the lipase to start the digestion process because it has its own lipase already present. Um, but essentially, we see similar structural transitions to bovine milk. If we actually look at it, six point pH six point five, so we know fatty acids are there and they're important in this behaviour, and and it's really critically dependent on where we may be um, in the in you know with respect to the pKa of the of the fatty acids. And so, if we drop the pH slightly and run um, human milk at pH six point five instead of pH seven point five, then we actually see that we form an inverse micellar cubic phase, we don't actually form the bicontinuous cubic phase that we see in the case of the cow milk and the goat milk. And this is important, I'll, I'll sort of come back to this 
um, behavior, but this is, we've seen that this is actually quite signature for human um, breast milk at that, at that pH. So to kind of jump ahead, if, we, if we're trying to simulate the, at least the structural behavior of human breast milk, then, then that kind of gives us a bit of a roadmap to, to aim for under those same conditions as we saw slightly different behavior for bovine uh, milk. So, um, so you might ask, well, what then happens with the vegetable ex extracts that are you know, part of a lot of people's diet and intended to substitute for milk? So if some of this structural behavior is for some reason important and we're, we're not there yet um, in understanding why, then you know, perhaps it, it'll take it, make for an interesting contrast or perhaps they all behave very similarly. All you need is a light liquid and a lot form by a continuous cubic phase, because it seems to be the case so far in the data that I've presented so far to you. So um, if we have a look at some um, you know, vegetable extracts or, or milk, if you, if you like to call it that. Um, so if we take soy milk then and, and digest soy milk under identical conditions to the bovine milk and human breast milk that we saw earlier, then um, this is digesting, digesting, digesting. So we're actually on our titration profile, we're consuming um, sodium hydroxide. So we're producing fatty acids. So there's nothing wrong with the digestion. We're producing the monoglycerides and fatty acids. And we get to the end point of digestion. So we get to the end of digesting the soy extract um, where it's quantitatively digested to monoglyceride and fatty acid. And all we see is some of the calcium soaks. So soy, the, the lipids that are in soy extract don't support that self-assembly behavior in the same way that we've seen for those, um, for those different mammal milks. So we've looked at a range of different mammal milks and they all form to some degree or other higher ordered sort of self-assembled structures, whether they be uh, inverse micellar cubic phases or you know, the really highly ordered bicontinuous cubic phases. Um, and then if we take the vegetable sources, then we don't see under the same conditions those systems supporting that same, um, I guess, um, sort of broad pattern of self-assembly where they don't form those higher ordered structures. They tend to, 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 to just form calcium soaps that don't self-assemble in the same way that, that the mammal milks do. So very interesting discrimination in, in the behaviour there. So Colin knows what's coming next. Um, infant formula. So the question then is, well, where does infant formula fit into these things? Because it's, you know, it's meant to be a substitute for human breast milk. Um, but we know that, you know, to, you know, to, a, to a greater or lesser degree there, they may or may not contain different milk components. And so, um, so where exactly do, do they fit? And can we use some of this scattering to kind of interrogate whether there's, I guess, there's similarity to um, to some of the mammal milks and, and to human milk in particular. So if we take um, different infant formula then, um, so we've got four different infant formulas here um, and I'm not gonna give you the brands for obvious reasons. Um, and I'm not saying whether some are better than others, um, but they're certainly all different. Well, these two are very similar. Um, these two are very, quite different to these two. So the top two systems both form self-assembled structures. So this one, forms a micellar cubic phase and has almost identical phase behavior to human breast milk that we saw earlier. This one forms an inverse hexagonal phase. It doesn't form the micellar cubic phase during digestion. Um, these are all digested under identical conditions to, to the bovine milk I showed earlier in human breast milk at pH 6.5. These two don't support that self-assembly at all. And we know from the, uh, the lipid analysis that they're, that they're different as well in these two. Um, more than likely um, uh, you know, have a high, much higher vegetable oil content, let me put it that way, than the, than the other two. Um, we don't have the access to the composition directly. So we've, we've looked at the lipid um, composition separately. And so I guess one of the important things is that they're, they're all different. And that, so they all have different um, starting triglycerides. And at the end of the gesture, that yields you know, different you know, some similar to others, but broadly different um, you know, monoglyceride and, and fatty acid uh, compositions at the end of digestion. So 
So we can try to sort of try and, I guess, pull some of that information together and see if there's anything in the way of, of trends. And so if we take some principal component analysis and, and look at what are the major drivers in terms of composition and, um, and where does that sort of fall in terms of dictating the self-assembly behaviour. And so we can see that we're in, when we're in the sort of positive space of, um, of PC1, so where, we've, where we tend to have sort of higher unsaturated um, fatty acids and tend to have lower palmitic acids, then that tends to drive this, um, this formation of um, the inverse micellar cubic phases. This is what this I2 sort of signifies. Um, and the others, the others is, is, is sort of the opposite, I guess. So um, the opposite trend. And then if we look at what happens with the monoglycerides, then uh, monopalmitin, which we know is a sort of critical component at the end of digestion for uh, human breast milk, kind of shows up as, as our sort of PC1 um, driver, but it's, it's sort of less, less clear really that it's driving. So PC1 is not really just helping us to discriminate between the self-assembled structures. So we can sort of see that there's self-assembled structures on either side of this, this sort of crossover line. Um, the PC2, we tend to see um, when, we, when we have a sort of a positive profile in PC2, it tends to sort of indicate that we might see an inverse micellar uh, cubic phase in that case. And the opposite being true when we have um, a lot of monoolein uh, present. So, and that, that, that again is broadly consistent with the idea that, you know, that human breast milk tends to form inverse micellar cubic phase um, rather than, than the other structures at the end, end point of digestion. So um, I'm not exactly sure how much time we've got. This is, this is only a few more minutes, Tommy. Um, but you know, we've, we've been thinking, well, how can we sort of use that then to try and design some systems that where we might deliberately want to go and, and mimic, um, yeah, mimic these, some of these milk systems from a structural perspective. So, you know, the design of infant formula has really been driven by compositional matching, not by trying to match behavior or match structure. Um, so, so, so looked at it a little bit differently and said, well, uh, let's just see what we need to do with bringing together certain lipid compositions and whether we can start to mimic um, the behavior of some of these systems um, uh, separately. And so, well, deliberately. And so, uh, so Andy Clulo, who's actually just gone, uh, left my group and gone over to the Australian Synchrotron to start working on the new Biosax beamline that's being built there at the moment. Uh, so he, he spent the last couple of years looking at, at this problem and other problems. For those that know Andy, he's, he's been a prolific um, scientist over the last four or five years, which has been fantastic for my group and, um, and he's, he's become a real feature of the Australian community. Um, so he's, he's taken um, what would normally be a very complex you know, mixture of triglycerides that constitute milk. So many thousands of different potential um, combinations of different fatty acid, um, different fatty acids in you know, different positions on the triglyceride and said, well, you know, can we take homotriglycerides and generate the same sort of structural behavior if we kind of bring them together in a bit of an educated way, but with increasing complexity. And so if you're really interested in this work, you know, we've, we've, had, we've put out a couple of papers on this now, um, and I'm only gonna show one slide of the actual results, um, but he's, he's done this for bovine milk and for, for human breast milk, as we'll see in bringing these homotriglycerides together um, to, to develop uh, systems that structurally mimic the behavior of human breast milk during digestion. And so the upshot of a, of a lot of his work, if we take this as our kind of target um, performance sort of indicator, if you like, um, where we're forming an inverse micellar cubic phase, so at the end point of digestion, um, then he's found that if you take one through to six triglycerides um, in the right proportions that you can't mimic the behavior, you can't get it to form the same um, self-assembled structures. But if you bring in the magical seventh triglyceride, then from a structural perspective, you can see that 
um, that we can pretty much mimic the, the self-assembly behavior of human breast milk by bringing those homotriglycerides together in the right composition, forming an emulsion. Um, so it's just emulsified in casein and um, digesting in the same way that we've digested the human uh, breast milk. So, so that's really, you know, if you like human milk by design, but from a structural perspective, not from a compositional perspective. So there's some interesting discussion, I think, to be had, and that's, that's sort of an evolving story around what that might mean from a nutritional um, perspective. So, um, so some take home points. So uh, self-assembly uh, occurs inside these milk droplets during digestion, and, and this has shown that in, in real time in a uh, physiologically relevant format, if you like. Um, and uh, we've also obviously shown that the structure formation is really critically dependent on lipid composition. Um, and that we can self assemble or we can assemble these systems and, and um, with sufficient patience and beam time um, determine what um, what we need to do in terms of bringing compositions together in order to to get them to form um, you know, specific specific structures that, that can mimic the behavior of bovine milk or human milk or potentially other systems if we would like to do that so I guess in a nutshell where, where does that all fit into the biggest picture so there's people in my group. Um, so the talk at Lund two days ago was largely around the drug delivery aspects um, of some of this, and um, always happy to talk about that, but not today. Um, we're also looking at can we use this to generate? You've seen some of the, the well, very quick snapshot on the mimics front, but also fortifiers for um, things like infant or premature infant nutrition, where the you know, digestion behavior of that is, is really important and understanding the, the digestion of that under sort of premature infant gastrointestinal conditions is really the sort of next frontier in, the, in some of that work. Um, and then the sort of third aspect of this is why. So why do these, well, why do we see this clustering where the mammal milks form these rich self-assembled structures and the, the vegetable sources don't? I and mean, it may be just kind of coincidence that, you know, the mammals, the, the, the lipids obviously that are in mammals is going to be different to the lipids that are in vegetables um, overall. But you know, there does I don't believe in coincidences in nature. We don't yet know the reason why there's a difference there. And I've probably headed off the main question that I often get asked during this when I give this talk. But um, you know, perhaps there's some other other thing at play that's got nothing to do with necessarily with lipid self-assembly, but is um, perhaps an immunological um, you know, an immunological reason for that self-assembled behavior. And perhaps those structured particles interact differently with the, the biology in the gut. And, and that's one of the areas that I'll be interested in working a lot more in when I can sort of clear my head and, and come over to Copenhagen and, and look at some of these questions. So um, lastly, some acknowledgements. So Australian Synchrotron has been great for this work in, um, in, the, in the staff at Australian Synchrotron, particularly Adrian Hawley, who um, I didn't squeeze his photo in here. He's, he's been an integral part of our group really for a few years now. Um, and uh, so he, he deserves special thanks. But yeah, Andy, uh, Melinda Saloon, Gisela Anna, and Chazza have really done the work that's contributed specifically to this talk. So thanks again for the opportunity, Tommy and Selma, for, uh, for presenting some of this work and look forward to any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for an excellent representation. I think it's good to see that you point out the importance of um, lipids even for going into more um, plant-based food because um, there's so much focus on the protein part that you, you tend to forget the lipid part of it. So you have got a lot of uh, some questions here, so I will to, to speed up things, uh, we, I will read. So from Alessandro Marangoni, uh, fascinating work. Did you do for a couple of samples uh, VAX? Are these pure liquid crystal or is that uh, crystalline material, uh, particularly for the lamellar phase with the calcium? Uh, so yeah, so the calcium soaps tend to precipitate out and um, we've never actually gone looking, to be quite honest, but I suspect that there probably is. Um, so, and the sort of clue, or the, the, the 
additional aspect to this is we're often looking in the wax for what's happening with drugs in these systems. So we're really interested in when we incorporate drug molecules. And so we're often looking in that space, but we're not specifically looking for crystallization of the lipids. Andy, Andy has looked at that a lot, obviously, with the homotriglyceride systems, you're much more likely to run into that, um, that situation when he's got high saturated lipid content in some of his mixed emulsions. So um, there's certainly some evidence of crystallization in those systems. Okay, so um, that's interesting. Something to do when you come to Copenhagen to look at this, and you can do it in Max Lab. Uh, We've already got the data. We've just never gone looking. <laughs> okay, okay. So there's a question for from Lars Nilsson. Very interesting presentation. I didn't quite get why the behavior between raw and homogenized bovine milk was different. Was this related to the droplet site and differences in the composition of the interfacial layer? You know, when you homogenize it, you break the membrane and so on. Yes, um, so the, the, the phase behavior is the same. It's just a lot slower because of the difference in droplet size. So you're right there. Um, so because the, um, you know, because the membrane constitutes such a low fraction of the total amount of lipid in the system, using this approach is not really the way to to try to understand that because we're obviously seeing the dominating behavior of the triglyceride core. Um, so we would need to use a different technique or um, you know, maybe use a, a um, you know, contrast matching neutron experiment to try to elucidate that behavior, but we haven't, haven't gone there yet. Okay, and then there is another question from uh, Alexander Marangoni. And he says, so on the point of uh, plant-based milk, the versus mammalian milk and self assembly, could it be the positional distribution of the fatty acid and uh, the role they play? In mammalian milk, saturated uh, fatty acids are in position SN2, while in vegetable yeah. they, they go to position SN1 and SN2. That could affect. That is yeah, that, that, that's the Andy's work, I think. Well, that, 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 no, I think that, that is true. And I think that the, the PC, perhaps I didn't spend enough time on the, on the PCA um, analysis that, that supports that that is, the, that is the case. So, you know, the differences in the lipid distributions are driving that, that some of those differences in the behavior, but I, I wanna know why. So why, why do mammal systems have those specific lipid so is it, is it that we just have those lipids in our body and it's a coincidence that they form, that they happen to support the formation of those structures or is there a, an evolutionary or otherwise reason why those lipids are there because the self-assembly drives some other process that we don't yet know what that is. Mm -hmm. So perhaps the formation of cubic phases in the gut has immunological consequences because we know that cubic phase particles can act as really good vaccine adjuvants, for example. So those sort of questions that I'm sort of interested in getting it to the heart of. I think krasimir has got his hand up too, Tommy, for a question. Yeah, I was just gonna oh. say, we have a raised hand, Tommy. Oh, okay. I, I don't know the rules. So do I have to raise hand to put the question in the... Uh, uh, you, you can uh, talk, um, have your questions now. So just go ahead. Uh, thank you. It's really fascinating um, research, Ben. Thank you very much. You got me thinking about um, the fact that um, um, mammalian milk, the digestion leads to complex structures. Would you speculate that the energy intake of these lipids, it will be slower. So they are designed to deliver energy more in a more sustained way, rather than being rapidly absorbed in the body like with the other type of lipids. Is that naive to think? I. I think that's it's, it's, that's an interesting hypothesis for sure. Um, and so Anna, who's at the front there, one of her tasks in her um, she didn't quite get there was to compare the rates of absorption of lipids with different structures that are formed. Um, she kind of got obsessed with what was happening with the drug, as a lot of my 
people do because most of them come from a pharmaceutical background, not from a phys chem background. So I try and push them to, towards other questions. But um, so yeah, that's that's still still an open question. I, I, my, now my original hypothesis was that actually it was the other way around that the formation of the cubic phase, for example, maybe gives you know better access and higher surface area to the particles for the lipase to, to drive digestion in people, for example, if you had um, like compromised digestion capability as an evolutionary thing, maybe that's a kind of a compensatory mechanism, but I don't, I don't think I believe that now. Um, but yeah, that's again, still an open question. Thank you. Uh, there is a question from uh, Sao Shufang. And there is as interesting research does the different uh, structure and fa or face baby during digestion mainly lead to taste or nutritional differences or other pyramids. It's a little bit what we have talked about now, but uh, what about taste then? Does it taste? So, well, we don't, yeah, we're interested in, well, we've been looking mainly at intestinal digestion so you don't taste obviously what's already in your intestine um, now in your mouth um, you know, the lingual lipase can perhaps suggest a very very small fraction of, of lipid that's present and it's quite interesting I've got a separate um, sort of ex experiment or thought that I've wanted to explore for a little while that um, because we know that some specific fatty acids act on um, bitter taste receptors. So act as, inhib as antagonists or inhibitors of, of bitterness um, in our taste. And uh, so what I want to know mm. is whether those fatty acids are produced by the li bilingual lipase in an infant as a mm. way of avoiding the baby rejecting the taste of the mother's milk. Um, pure hypothesis, um, but I, it would be really interesting to take some um, Get, get a baby to spit out some lingual lipase and um, you know, see what fatty oh. acids are generate, generated in the early stages of digestion of breast milk. Yeah. Okay. So um, the nutrition yeah. question is an interesting one because we have got data showing that you do get differences in rates of absorption of sort of co-incorporated hydrophobic compounds um, depending on what the phase sort of trajectory is. So... Um, yeah, that's a question that's that's definitely ongoing as well. But there's certainly enough evidence now that different mm. um, systems are form or uh, facilitating that to a greater or lesser degree. Mm. So, so there is a final question from Alessandro Marangoni. Maybe you want to post it, post it yourself. So, we are still a couple of minutes left. So, please, Alessandro. Uh, thank you very much for the amazing presentation. I just wanted to mention, uh, have you tried or seen any work on the LC structures that would get formed by SN2, let's say, uh, two monopalmitin versus one monopalmitin? Uh, I mean, in these non-lamellar faces, they probably have very different behavior. And what I was just commenting is that, um, uh, you know, if they're at position two, the saturates, they get assimilated as monoglycerides in the body, right? If they're at position one and three, they, they get split into fatty acids, then react, can, can react with calcium and, and then they become insoluble calcium salts. So a natural selection would have like pushed the, the saturates at position two uh, just for energy, right? Otherwise you waste a lot of that energy, but, uh, but I think that you're onto something here about the self-assembly of, of, the, of the two versus the one uh, species of the saturated monos, right? Yeah, definitely. So we haven't taken the two and the one separately and, you know, and deliberately digested those. It's partly because it's hard to, to get that OPO in isolation. Um, there's always other things in there that's going to confound the, the data anyway, unless you, unless you can point us in a source of pure OPO. Um, and but you know, we can take the more complex systems like these and try to try to pinpoint what's happening compositionally and, and relate that to the, the structures that are formed. So the um, you know, the PC1 in this case, I thought that 
because we've got, you know, we're in the PC1, so in panel B on this, the slide at the moment, um, sorry, I'm pointing my finger at it instead of the pointer. Give me one second. Um, so the monoparmitin that's more prevalent in the bovine, um, well, more for it, we know definitely more prevalent in human milk, um, but in the mammal milks generally compared to the vegetable sources is, is really the discriminating factor between the two. So that makes sense compositionally. Um, then if we look at the differences in phase behavior, we don't actually, so we can see that, you know, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy that the, the bovine human and goat milks are on the positive PC side, but that's because that's because of what we've seen over here, but we already knew or we suspected that would happen, but it's not allowing us to really discriminate between the modes of self-assembly. When we look at the, at the, you know, the monoglycerides driving that are primarily driving differences in behavior. But you know, the more subtle differences on this side do seem to indicate for that inverse micellar cubic phase formation. So we need to probably do a bit more to interrogate this, um, you know, this, this, this link, but um, there certainly does seem to be some, even in these much more complex systems where it's you know, hard to make those really definitive calls, there does seem to be some links there that we'll be able to exploit if we can do some more pure, um, you know, more pure positionally defined systems. So thanks Alejandro for your interest because it's it is really a, the next the next thing I think in, in this area. So you know, Andy's Andy's probably taken too far of a leap in going to the homo triglycerides and, and it, we've sort of skipped that that part.